Okay. The following interview was conducted with Dave Umbacher for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, July 14, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dave. Good morning. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Good morning. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I was born in 1944 in Manhattan, Kansas. And uh, it was, those were war years, of course. And, uh, and my dad was, was in, in the war in, uh, in China and Burma. And so um, I spent just a couple of years in, in Kansas. And then our family relocated after the war to Denver, Colorado. And I spent my growing up years in Denver till the eighth grade. Eighth grade, we moved to Minneapolis when my father got a transfer with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, so I went to junior high, high school, and the University of Minnesota okay. in uh, Minneapolis. Tell us a little bit about high school. What was that? What sort of activities were you involved in? Athletics or uh, whatever? Yeah, I was, uh, I was a swimmer. And uh, How'd the team do? Uh, we did pretty well. Good. Yeah, Edina was a good swim team. And uh, I started out uh, trying to play tennis, couldn't do that very well, decided I'd try diving and went out for the diving team and was mediocre at that. And one day the coach just uh, said, everyone has to do time trials. And so, and we said, except the divers, right? And he said, no, no, no divers as well. So, uh, so I did a time trial and I ended up being the second fastest backstroker on the team. So they started uh, to teach me how to do the backstroke, <laughs> and then from then on I was a backstroker. So, uh, <laughs> but always liked photography. Uh, that Would was you, always were, a were hobby. You, were you in the club during high school? I don't think I was. Oh. I'm not much of a joiner or a clubber or anything like that. So I don't think I was. I, I provided a few pictures for the school paper, and uh, and I just did it as a hobby. And I was just fiercely interested in, it, but not enough to join clubs. So okay. But that's really when it started, junior high and high school. I remember pestering Dad to, to buy me some cameras. What kind of camera did you get? Oh, it was a Minolta. My first one was a little rangefinder Minolta. And I uh, wish I had that today. I don't know where that <laughs> got to. <laughs> right. Tell us a little bit about college. Did you, were you a resident or uh, did you live on campus? Our family lived in, in Minneapolis. Actually, it was a southwest suburb in Minneapolis. And I went to the University of Minnesota. And my major at that time was fish and wildlife biology which was on the St. Paul campus, which is in like the northeast corner of St. Paul. So, so it was like an hour and a half commute, really. So it was like going to another town. But I did, uh, I stayed in the residence hall. I was uh, in a dormitory the first year in Brewster Hall, which was an ancient, creaky, dilapidated structure. And we, we bowled in the halls with beer cans and uh, the bowling ball would roll of its own volition just because the hall tilted. and. <laughs> Fun place. Yeah. Well, what other activities were you involved in? And uh, what about some, the, what was the campus like about the enrollment? And tell us a little bit about campus life in those days. It was, uh, at that time, one of the larger uh, Big Ten universities, actually one of the larger universities in the country. But as I recall, and I unfortunately don't, I think the enrollment was something like uh, 37,000, something that sounds pretty puny today. But it was big at that time, and I remember being a little bit put off by the size of it. I liked being on the St. Paul campus. That was the Ag campus, uh, which is where wildlife biology was located. And I liked that because of its its small size. It was a little bit more uh, uh, homey, right. and I appreciated that. I, uh, I think I went two and a half or three years as a wildlife biology major, and then I switched to journalism. And that switched me over to the main campus and the Minneapolis campus. Okay. So, and I finished up with a with my degree in, in journalism, photojournalism, and a minor in wildlife. What biology. year did you receive your degree? Oh, you're trying to put me on the spot here. It's uh, somewhere around 66, 67. I I finished most of my coursework in 66, uh, but I wasn't finished. And then I I became interested in in uh, a woman who had been a friend, a kind of a lifelong family friend, and she was living in Boulder, Colorado, and she was currently attending Colorado University. So I started commuting out there to visit her, and that sort of got in the way of college, and so I, I dropped, dropped out for about a year, or a couple semesters anyway, to go out while she finished her degree at, at CU. And then we both came back to Minneapolis, and I finished uh, my coursework, with the exception of foreign language, because having switched from wildlife biology to uh, uh, journalism, 
they added a foreign language requirement. And so uh, when, I, when they hired me down here at Purdue, I came down lacking still my foreign language, and, and then I took that at Purdue and got my degree from the University of Minnesota. How did you so, the, was there a career path before you came to Purdue? <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, so to speak. Had to do mostly with weather. Um, <laughs> I finished most of my coursework uh, in at the end of the, the fall semester, fall quarter, I'm sorry, at Minnesota, which I think was December. So I got out of there basically December, January. And you know what Minneapolis is like in December and January. And we had been there about 10 years. I'd been there about 10 years. And I was, uh, I, I didn't mind the cold so much, but I was getting tired of the short days and the darkness and everything. And, and I, I, would, I was ready for a break in the weather. So when I started applying for jobs, I had two immediate uh, responses, and one was uh, as a newspaper photographer with the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, right, right in the backyard there, and the other one was with Purdue University, and I had no idea where it was, and I looked it up on a map, and there it was in the middle of Indiana, and thought, that's south of here. I'm going there, <laughs> and so and that's what did it. Um, Herb Schaller, who was the director at that time of the news service here at Purdue, flew up to Minneapolis, interviewed me in the airport at Minneapolis, and uh, gave me a really good interview, and gave, told me a lot about the town and a lot about the campus, but I really didn't care. I, I cared that the job was a diverse job. It was going to give me exposure to a lot of different kinds of photography, uh, science, agriculture, uh, sports. You know, it was, it was a really good primer in just every kind of photography you could possibly hope to take. And we weren't going to be here much more than two or three years anyway, so it didn't matter. So um, I said, sure. Were you sure. married by that time? Uh, I think we were, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we were. Okay. Yep. yep. So you came... And actually, we were because by the time I came down here, uh, uh, Leslie was just a couple months old. Oh, okay. Leslie okay. had just been born uh, before we came down in 1968. Okay. So, so that's why I said I... I, I got my degree somewhere between 66, 67, and 68 <laughs> because of uh, various finishing points. There you go. Okay. But I think that the actual degree came in 68. When you came, was this a new, a new position or did you? It uh, was, okay. yeah. Up until that time. Uh, they didn't have any photography? They had some publications, of course. They did. They had, they well, had the lots of different. publications and basically there like were campus two. Campus Copy is one that comes to mind. That's right. Campus Copy was one of them and that's, that was one of the main jobs that I did. Yeah. Um, when I came here, our offices were in South Campus Courts, which were temporary structures, still, still, temporary. still temporary, going strong. but. Herb Schaller was directing the news service in South Campus Courts, and Bill Whelan was directing the publications office, and they did campus copy. News service did primarily publications that were outside the university, newspapers and magazines. They provided news releases and services, photographs and such. And up until that time, both these, both these offices, publications and news service, were relying on uh, Julian Jacobson's uh, office, Central Photographic. And, uh, and, and they were doing a good job, except that Herb Schaller wanted more of a photojournalistic approach in the, in the pictures. And so they wanted a photojournalist. They didn't want just a broadly trained studio photographer. Uh, they wanted a photojournalist. And so they created this position. And so I was the first one in it in February 1968. Okay. Then take it from there. What some of the things that you were involved in and changes and... And I remember at your retirement that that uh, 1973 video with, that they showed yeah. the perspective that that was really and particularly how photography has changed. But that, that yeah, Gene told me that that was a surprise because you didn't know about that. <laughs> That's true. That was a surprise. And in that video were uh, myself and Lynn Doyle, who is also just recently retired from right. uh, the Office of Periodicals at Purdue, and she was uh, the editor of Perspective which was a, a publication that was created by Bob Topping, right. who was, uh, I think, Herb Schaller's successor as the director in the news service down there. So Lynn and I were doing layout where we would do, yeah, we would, we would get printed, you know, type on paper, and we would cut the paper up and wax it and stick the wax onto boards and, and wax the photographs onto the boards, and then the boards would be taken to a newspaper and they would photograph the, the boards and make screens, metal screens of those, and those would go in the, the presses and, and make the newspapers. So it was a whole different process. Pica sticks and, uh, and 
calculating scale of you know size and scale of photographs with with little with a wheel a calculator wheel and uh, yeah <laughs> whole different world in fact it's really that's that's been so much fun being in a job this long and especially a technologically oriented job like this one is uh, is just seeing the evolution because you are right um, you know, I got there just a little bit after flash powder and stuff like that, but not much. I mean, they were still foiled, filled flash bulbs, and it was pretty photography by these by today's standards was really primitive, whole different ball game. And so, to to look back and see what I was doing then and and what we're doing now, just brings a smile to my face because it's been so much fun and just being. Uh, it's like a dream come true. It's it's uh, what I'm able to do these days with photography are things that I've just all my life been thinking wouldn't it be great if I could do this it wouldn't it be great if I could take the snow fencing out of that picture or the telephone lines out of that sky and uh, and now you can and now you can of course that's subject to altogether different constraints uh, because with photojournalism uh, you're not supposed to mess with the photograph too much uh, basically you're supposed to confine yourself to lightening it or darkening it or burning and dodging or contrasts or, or color you know balancing things like that you're not supposed to take people out of the picture or put different heads on people and stuff like that I mean you've you've seen stories in the media where publications uh, even giants respected giants like National Geographic have gotten in trouble for it for just taking a little too much advantage of the technology and it's it's easy to do um, and we try to draw the line. We try to keep it very journalistic, uh, very archival, because people like you will look at these pictures someday and, and will say, huh, I don't remember that that building was there. Why wasn't this there another building behind it? You know. So if you do things like that, if you make a picture just look better, uh, you're, you're removing some archival quality, some historical quality. So we try not to do that. But I do admit to having, like I say, taking, taking some orange snow fencing out of the front of a picture where it's just like you, your eye can go no other place but to this blob of orange snow fencing or a trash can or something like that. And I'll, I'll maybe Photoshop a little bit of bush in front of the, the, sure. the trash can. Hopefully, that's not taking too much uh, historical accuracy. It's just sort of cleaning it a little my... bit, enhancing it, the whole shot. That's the, whole the hope. Shot. That's the hope, exactly. Right. What about uh, some of the assignments? The, tell us a little about the equipment, how that's changed, and also some of your assignments, because you operate w w for the university. That's true. Although, uh, strictly speaking, I do just work for really uh, just a couple offices, news service and periodicals. Uh, but that's changed. I, like I say, I started out working for two offices. I was 60-20, 60%, 20%. Uh, it doesn't add up, but it was a, there was some sure. administrative. It, it, it started out, I think we did that, in, uh, a 60-40, and then they split it up because of some administrative stuff. But anyway, there was, a, there was a percentage split between the new service and publications. And then when, um, when Joe Bennett became the director of the new service and he went up to Hubdi Hall, he brought most of the new service all of the new service basically up to engineering and administration buildings. Right. So that was a physical split between the new service and Bill Whalen's office of publications. And at that point, I, uh, I pretty much became the news service photographer only, and they hired other photographers at first under my jurisdiction and then later just under Dave Brandon's jurisdiction to do the photography for publications. Right. But uh, what are some of the assignments? Talk a little bit about some of those. And you've worked, you know, the presidential. You've worked done some of your key assignments that you've done, or some of the shots that you'd like to share with the researchers. Well, the assignments were just what I envisioned when I accepted the job sure. with Herb Schaller. They were extremely broad, very diverse. Uh, took me all over the state of Indiana, around the country, and eventually around the world. Uh, How did that come about? That came about with President Beering and the, the fundraising campaign. That's when Purdue was first getting into fundraising, and I think it was called the Plan for the 80s, was Beering's plan. And, and I think, uh, don't, don't quote me on this, but I think that was one of our first major fundraising campaigns. Sure. That was when we were first getting into it. And Beering had the idea 
uh, with Joe Bennett that it would be a good idea to send a team which consisted of Ray Cubberly and myself, which was a photographer and a videographer, basically around the world uh, to photograph Purdue alums, Purdue, pe people who had been touched by Purdue, Purdue degrees, uh, you know, who had been here, educated here, taught here, uh, but basically Purdue alum, alums, and, and who were now making a really uh, a successful life, who had a, an impact on society and the country and the world in general, important people, people who had become important. So, so that was really fun. Um, just so, some memorable ones that kind of stick in your mind. That um, did you go to Hong Kong? Were you in Hong Kong, or did you get to China? No, actually, Ray Coverly did. That's been more recently. I think Ray oh. got to China. I I did not do that, and that was uh, that was because we were hiring still photographers to do the local stuff by that point, which was uh, you know more economically feasible. Sure. But no, some of the fun ones were uh, were in Europe and Switzerland, and seeing the Eiger and the Monk and some of these. Uh, these famous mountains that I'd read about, and New Zealand and Australia and uh, and England and Scotland, some farms in Scotland that were just beautiful. The whole thing was just you, you just dream come true. And were, tons did you, of these were a lot a lot of the events and things that uh, is that what you were doing events that were or not necessarily. They weren't really events. Okay. They were people. They okay. were always based on people. And so we would go to a community. It might be a farm in Scotland, where where this guy had developed uh, something to do. He had an sure. agriculture degree from Purdue, and he had gone to Scotland, and he had uh, he had he started a corporate farming situation or something. Um, it was always, uh, you know, or in, I think in Switzerland it was someone uh, who ran a research company, you know. So it was just uh, people who had become important and who had, who, you know, who had relied on their Purdue degrees and their Purdue education. And made an impact on, on it, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah. good. You've also done um, uh, what, uh, some off-campusing of the traveling shows. Did you do anything like, do you have anything like that? Any uh, traveling shows that you've done over time? Or not? No. no. Okay. Uh, that would, that's typically not done in the news service. Okay. That would be more of an artistic thing, uh, okay. something, uh, an artist, a, pho a photographic artist who would have a gallery show, and that show would travel to different museums or different galleries. Yeah. And we've never done anything really like that. Yes. Um, basically, our, our displays are newspapers and magazines just throughout the world, and, uh, and that's been... Quite broad, actually. Yeah. Um, we get we get requests all the time from from countries all over the world who have seen, uh, you know, stories about research that's done here at Purdue, and they're requesting more information and photographs on that, and that's when I become involved. And, right. And uh, so that that's fascinating stuff as well, as right. you can imagine. Are you are you uh, how are you archiving them? Do you? Uh, <laughs> That must be a challenge. It is a challenge. Right. And that's changed again, uh, you know. Because you must get a lot of, as you say, a lot of requests for them and hard to, uh, you have to be able to access them. And That's true. And it's become, again, a lot easier in the last 10 years, say, with digital. Um, but before digital, 10 years ago, it was all... It was all film. First of all, it was black and white negative with 35 millimeter single lens reflex cameras. That's what I started out using. There was a lot of pressure on me when I came here to use larger cameras. They wanted me to use the, uh, like a speed graphic, a 4x5 speed graphic, which was back then a fairly typical press camera and was just being sort of phased out by smaller Roloflexes, which were 120 film and made a, a, a negative two and a quarter inches square. And, and that was a pretty popular photojournalistic camera because it was smaller and lighter than the big speed graphics. Um, so when I came to Purdue in 68, they wanted me to use at least a roll a quarter, a roll a flex, a two and a quarter camera. And I was dead set on doing everything 35 millimeter. And there was a, a lot of resistance. People said, oh, no, 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 the negative's too little. It's grainy. It's, you know, we can't, we can't do that quality. And, of course, we could, and we did, and uh, I, I've used larger format cameras, but basically uh, I always appreciated the, the size and the weight and the flexibility of 35 millimeter. But anyway, black and white negatives were what we first started doing. Then eventually it shifted to color negatives and, and color slides. And, 
And even storing these are different processes. Storing the slides, we usually put them in pages of sleeves, and those are in ring binders or in file drawers. 35 millimeters in strips, and it's in glassine envelopes, in small boxes or metal files. And we have a lot of those different types up in archives that oh, we collect. Yeah, all and the that's time. that's part of the problem too. Just the different types of media. Right. Several different types of media doesn't make it easy to sort and select. And uh, and we had, we still do have, her name is Sue Honey, and she still works with us at the News Service today. And she was our secretary back then, and she would hand number every single frame of every 35 millimeter black and white I did with a, a dip pen and India ink. And I mean, telling you this now, it seems just crazy that we were, you know, doing that much labor intensive stuff, but we did. I mean, it was, uh, you know, we had people to do it and that's what we paid them for. And, and so, so we numbered every negative and basically we tried to, uh, you know, we kept track of, of, we kept a log of what stuff was and where it was. Now, of course, it's digital and the computer does a lot of that for us. The, the, neg the frames are numbered automatically by the camera. When I come back from an assignment, uh, I will pop the card, the recording card out of the camera, put that into my computer and dump the whole file into a, a bulk file and, and name and number that, put all the metadata into another file which can be retrieved by search engines. And um, basically all that information goes into a database. So then the database can be searched. All you need is a name or a date or a place or some keyword. You look that up and the database will at least find the information on that and it will tell you theoretically where that black and white negative is or where that color slide is or where that digital file is on a CD or a DVD somewhere. What the medium is and where it's stored. So it's crazy and it's convoluted and it's uh, absolutely not perfect, but we've we've kept it fairly fairly good and it works fairly well. Um, it's just convoluted. And part of the collection today is still down at South Campus Courts, a lot of the black and white negatives and the color negatives. Most of the color slides are now at Engineering Administration and and most of the all the digital files I guess yeah. are at and we're, the condition of them, are they in pretty good shape? Yeah, yeah, I, right. yeah I think the storage has been pretty decent. Mm -hmm. um, not, ar not archival storage, and in fact we've even found out uh, midstream sometimes that the, the sleeves we're storing stuff in isn't archival, and we'll try and go back and switch everything out of them. And that wasn't perfect either. No. Uh, a lot of the stuff never got pulled out, and uh, some of, the of them slides. were in little envelopes because we've got some of those upstairs, all those photographs that were the, the headshots that were done. Right. Uh, little brown, little envelopes that we've got them in. You know. Exactly. Yeah. And depending on what the envelope was made out of and whether it was acid free or any number of other things, whether it was glassine or whether it was some sort of polymer, uh, all have different archival qualities. Um, but a lot of the early glassine now, when I pull those out of the files, has yellowed, and I don't know if it's damaged the negatives in or not. Uh, probably not. Probably they not. all look good to me sure. when I take them out. And, but, you know, that's a, a wide range of, of uh, damage. I would say, for the most part, the quality is all really good still sure, uh, right. for most of the stuff. Yeah. What's your contact with? Do the media contact you quite a bit for photographs and things? Mm -hmm. Oh, And yeah. also you've had some things in... Uh, what some of the magazines too do they they pick up Purdue pictures like Time? Oh, yeah. And, you know. yeah, yeah, we've been yeah my stuff and the news service stuff, my photographs and our our news releases are in virtually every newspaper and every magazine in the world, and I have been published in in practically every major and minor publication in this country and all over the world. Right. Uh, it's it's really I tried to keep track at one point because I was trying to. You know, hoping to put all this in my resume for if I ever went out and got another job, which <laughs> another <laughs> big waste of time. But anyway, it just got to be impossible right. because uh, you know, in any single week, I might be published in you know, 17, 18, 20 publications, and keeping track of those uh, has been difficult as well. We used to have clipping services, people who actually. Would, would read newspapers and magazines, clip out the article, and mail it to us. Right. And then there was a little sticker on it telling you what, we've got some of those up there. Bacons what, and, uh-huh. 
what and people subscribe or oh, yeah. subscribe to these clipping yeah, services exactly. and then a little sticker would be on there saying what what the source of that publication exactly so we <laughs> I mean, did that and we yeah, we've tried you know every number of things now um, you know <laughs> things are electronic sure and basically uh, we do have have clipping services you know the the term is no longer accurate but basically they're like a source is in other words thing. right but but a lot of what we do is just with with computer searches. There are just search engines who do nothing but that, and we can do searches for that search everything that's been published about Purdue except sports, say, or except agriculture, and we try and narrow it that way. And then we consolidate all these, and we we print a clipping service, and we send that out to the deans and the department heads and the president and all those people who we like to think that you know what we do is important and and they should keep paying our paychecks for us. So anyway. Um, do you do athletics? Do you, uh, um, I do, but uh, I've never done that officially. Athletics uh, has always been sort of a separate entity. They've had separate budgets and, uh, and, and agriculture a little bit the same way. Okay. So they, those two have typically had their own writers and their own photographers, or they hire those people as freelance people. And so a lot of the sports that I've done has been either just the sports that has been needed for publications or periodicals or the news service, which is enough to make it interesting, or a lot of it has been just with the Associated Press. I've worked for the Associated Press since uh, I think I came in 1968, and I think either that year or 1969, they called me up, and this was the Associated Press, and it was, I think, uh, Doug Roberts was the chief photographer at that time for the AP in Indianapolis and he called me up and said you've got a running back up there named Leroy Keyes and we would like a photograph of Leroy Keyes and so I went over to can't remember I think it was Owen Hall or Tarkington where he was uh, a resident and I got a picture of Leroy sitting on the bed with his hand on his chin and his eyes up looking kind of thoughtful. That was a, if I do say so, it was a great shot. I mean, it was really a nice shot. It was black and white and sent that to the AP. Actually, I, I got that story wrong. The whole assignment was for UPI. I got that assignment for UPI and, and I did it and I sent the picture down to UPI and immediately got a call from AP saying, hey, nice picture, Leroy. Can you shoot the next basketball game for us? And, uh, and that's where my, my oh, AP okay. career started. So I started drinking for the AP, started doing a lot of basketball, almost all the basketball and football and whatever else they needed and whatever else needed to be covered sure. locally. And then in terms of my job, uh, my, my job at Purdue, they do that too. They call me when they've seen one of our stories that they're interested in and want me to follow up with a photograph if we haven't covered it photographically. And so they kind of use me as a, as a produce stringer as well. When the news service doesn't give them what they want, they tell me what they want and I get it for them. Oh, so, okay. That's so, a good assignment, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. been a lot of fun too. Right. Uh, and also you got photography in your life because at that, uh, all those pictures that were taken, it was wonderful. <laughs> at his retirement thing, there was a lot of photographs. And tell us a little about, uh, you're the outdoorsman. Yeah, and that's another kind of funny story because I always have been an outdoorsman, but when those two interests merged and it was whatever it was backpacking or kayaking or you, know, you, you name it I wanted to photograph it and so in the early days I was backpacking with twice as much equipment as everybody else because I would carry the tons of, of equipment long lenses and big camera bodies and with kayaking it was even tougher because then it had to be waterproofed and it had to be in waterproof boxes under the deck or something. I mean, it was hard to do. And so <laughs> basically I, I did that for a while. I tried because my ethic was if I'm going to take photographs of things I love, I want to do it as a professional and I, wanna, I want these pictures to be as good as I can make them. Well, that involves a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money. And a lot of the other people in your party may not be that interested in <laughs> photography, so they want to kind of keep things moving, you know. So anyway, it didn't exactly work out. And to, <laughs> to make a fairly long story a little shorter, the, the saving grace was the little point-and-shoot, the little shirt pocket cameras. And I finally drew the line one day and said, you know, it's okay not to be a professional photographer every day of your life. 
when I'm kayaking or when I'm fly fishing or when I'm backpacking, it's okay to be an amateur photographer and have your little shirt pocket camera and take snapshots, you know? And, and that was so freeing for me. I mean, that was, that was a really fun day a of breakthrough. my life. A breakthrough. <laughs> a real true breakthrough because, <laughs> because from that time on, I've never been very far from a point and shoot. I carry a point and shoot with me almost all the time. And that's where a lot of the photographs you saw came from. Uh, they were excellent. Point and shoots today are excellent. I mm -hmm. mean, you can get an amazing image from a camera the size of a pack of cigarettes. Sure. Not that I would know how big a pack of cigarettes is, but, you know, I've heard. There's, that's so. right, yeah. But anyway, it's, uh, my, only, my only drawback throughout the years has been uh, they didn't make them waterproof enough soon enough, and so I've drowned more than my share of cameras, but uh, and <laughs> dropped a few off cliffs, and uh, I, I'm uh, pretty hard on point and shoots. But anyway, it's great because they are tiny and light, and the fact that they are with you every place and all the time enables you to take a lot of photographs you wouldn't take if you needed a great big 35 millimeter you or have a set up and with your lens and you got to get it out of your bag and you got to set it up and you got to say wait a minute because wait a minute doesn't work in most of the things in your life right. as I've found so so yeah the point and shoot was was and continues to be just a, a real blessing to me I just yeah. love them. Do you take a lot of family pictures too I bet? Yeah I do yeah. and uh, um, do they have a similar, are they interested in photography? Yeah, they are. Yeah. In fact, uh, my, my wife pretty much is not because she just delegates that to me. She would just rather have me do it. It's something <laughs> she's not very interested in and, and I, I can do it probably better than she can, at least in some cases. But my son, Matthew, and my daughter, Leslie, are both fantastic photographers. They I had both- a good teacher. Pardon? They have a good teacher. I don't know if it's that. You know, I don't know what I gave them, but, but whatever it was, they, they got it. Whether it was genetic or whether it was learned or whether, I, I don't know what happened, but, but both of them are very, very gifted photographers. Matt uh, basically is a, is a Purdue engineer. He's a seismic structural engineer who until just recently has been working in Berkeley, California uh, as a seismic structural engineer. And uh, his wife Amy is a is a doctor who's just working on her uh, postdoc now in Utah. So they're currently in Utah. But he could have probably easily earned a living in photography. And he's still a really really good amateur. It's it's embarrassing how many trips I come back from. And I still do climbing trips with him and kayak trips and raft trips. Just got back from rafting the Salmon River uh -huh. with him uh, at the end of last month, and his wife was along. And when we post our pictures. His still just put me to shame in many cases. I mean, he sees things from such a different point of view and a different perspective that I'm still learning from him. You know, every time I see his take on the trip that I just was on, it's like, of course, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I see that? Why didn't I look at it like that? So it's still, you know, I'm still learning from him, and he's probably still learning from me right. in the it's same way. Right, it's a shared way. thing, right. And Leslie, my daughter, um, she was at that. She was taking pictures too at the retirement. Oh yeah, she was. Yeah. And she's she's still a good photographer, and basically, uh, she's chief curator uh, for an art center, the John Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and and uh, when she was in high school, she was a good amateur photographer. Took classes from Tom Schaefer here at Westside High School, who's recently retired from that job. But Tom Schaefer, in fact, taught both those kids photography in high school, and, and they learned a lot from Tom, too. He did a fine job. Um, but when Leslie got ready to go to college, uh, she, she realized she wanted to go probably to an art school. Uh, she wanted to really go to the Art Institute of Chicago, which is a pretty expensive place, and uh, so we told her that we would give her all the help we could. We were prepared to help her with her college education, but probably not at a place like Chicago Art Institute. So she applied for scholarships, and, and she did it on the basis of the art portfolio that she had collected at Westside High School under Tom Schaefer, and a lot of that was photography. And basically, uh, she went to a sort of a, a round table of employers that was down at uh, Indianapolis Art Museum. And Taking her portfolio with exactly, her? Exactly. She took her portfolio, and there was a representative from the Art Institute of Chicago and saw the portfolio. And just on the basis of her photography only, uh, they, they awarded her enough scholarship money that she could go there. So um, 
and, and she's since used photography and printmaking in her job, but uh, now she's pretty much beyond making art, although she's a fantastic quilt maker, and she's still cranking out quilts whenever there's a, a wedding or a baby or anything, and she, and she does it all stitch at a time by hand, and, and she's an extremely gifted quilt maker in terms of the, uh, the patterns that she uses and the vision that she has in terms of color. She has so much more ability in seeing color than I do, that again, it's humbling and embarrassing. She, um, you've probably heard of perfect pitch. And, and I think that, I don't know if there is a term, but I think Leslie has perfect color because she could come into this room and look at your jacket and then she could drive back up to Sheboygan and she could get out a color palette and she could pick that color palette out. And if she were to mail it back to you and you were to put it on your sleeve, she would nail it. And uh, she's a that's great eye for that. That is that is hard to do. Very. And uh, she she has an eye for color like no one I've ever seen. I've been shopping for her for quilt fabrics, and she'll buy this and she'll buy that and she'll buy this and that. And at the end of it, I'll say, "So how many quilts are you working on?" And she says, "This is all for one." And I'm thinking, "Huh?" Because to me, never in the whole <laughs> wide world would I buy those colors for one quilt. And then you know, she's eight able to blend later, them together and it the turns quilt, out nicely. And it's just like cosmic what she's done in terms of how she thinks in terms of color. Oh. How, how has the Chauncey Village changed since you've been here? Oh. Oh. And the campus. <laughs> I usually ask people that Immensely, to get a reaction. Enormously. Yeah. What was it like when you first came though? Well, was... my, first, my first recollection is not so much of Chauncey Village so much as it was in terms of Lafayette in general. And when we drove down from Minneapolis, we actually didn't drive directly here. We drove to Champaign because my brother-in-law and my sister were both professors there. And we drove down there to kind of set up a base and we came over here to look for apartments. And this was in February, it might have been in January, but anyway, it was middle of winter and it was bitter cold in, in Minneapolis. And we drove down here and it was not nearly as cold. In fact, when we drove over to West Lafayette and Lafayette to look for an apartment, it was warm enough that it was raining. And we thought, boy, what a great place that it can rain in February, you know? Right. Good. <laughs> so, so what a good decision. However, it was dark and dreary. <laughs> and we came in via Crawfordsville and 231, came up from the south which brings you in 3rd Street or 4th Street, something like that, with right. Crown Laundry and, and, and uh, and it didn't look so hot back then. I mean, it was that was kind of the warehouse side of town and uh, railroads. And we looked at each other and thought, hmm. Right through the center of town. We've definitely been to prettier places. Than this. When we got to the center of town, it got a little better because then we could see the historic aspect of Lafayette. And we really loved the courthouse. Courthouse was just yes. a knockout. And we did take a couple laps just through the downtown streets. And we were amazed at the the number and the condition of the old buildings because both of us being pretty much westerners the west is a lot newer than even indiana is and so we were impressed with the age of the buildings and how well they were maintained and how active uh, lafayette's downtown was however today it's much more active and it's much more beautiful and uh, you know everything is just so much sure. nicer i mean this 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 now and i, I I don't usually think that. I usually think progress goes in a direction I typically don't like to see things go. I think with Lafayette and West Lafayette and Purdue, they've really gone in, for the, for the most part, pretty good direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we have bookshops and coffee shops, and, and we don't have just the, I don't know, we so, never had slums and, and, and really blighted neighborhoods, but I think everything today really looks just so much right. nicer and so much better, and downtown area is still active and vital, and the farmer's market, and same thing with the Chauncey Village. I think uh, when I got to the village, uh, John von Erdsmendorf and, uh, and his crew were busy nailing up wood shelves for Vaughn's bookstore, and uh, you know, and we, Spent a lot of time helping them get that place ready, and and, uh, and where did you first? Where did you finally live when you first came here? Williamsburg on the Wabash, okay. the apartments. We mm -hmm. saw those when we were driving across the bridge, and they just looked great, sitting there on the river with these little ponds by them. And right. so, it was the first place we checked, and it was kind of expensive for us, but we decided to just bite the bullet and give it a try. And so that was the first place, and we 
promptly got flooded out of there. We, I think the first spring, <laughs> you know, the flood was in our living room. And not for that reason, I don't think, but, but uh, for You're some reason. You're on the reason, river there, that's we're right. We're on the river. So we moved to higher ground and a uh, couple of apartments, and then we rented a house on Salisbury and Robinson, uh, which is right across the street from what was a gas station and recently has been a coffee shop or a little right. restaurant. And we lived in that little rental house for a uh, couple of years, and we're really happy there. But at that point, we were friends with uh, with a woman named Marie Stewart at the at the news service, and she had a little house on Rosendy Hart Street, and she and her husband invited us over to her house for parties, and we just loved their little house, and it was just the greatest place. And we we told them, if ever you sell this house, call us first. And so, you know, not having a nickel in the bank, we said that, but anyway. Uh, a couple months later, she said, you know, I'm going to take you up on your offer. My husband and I have decided to take early retirement. We're going to move into our cabin up on Lake Freeman and just commute to work, and we're going to sell our house here in West Lafayette. So it's yours if you want it. So, you know, gasp, gulp. I uh, called my parents real fast. Well, I asked her how much she wanted, and she thought $27,000, which was, of course, astronomical to me. And uh, called mom and dad to see what they could do, and, and they were willing to help us with a down payment. And so uh, went ahead and accepted their offer, bought the house, totally unprepared for any such thing. And that's where we've been uh, oh, for 35 great. years. It's a, great, it's a handy it's location. A, it's a beautiful location. Right. You can walk, you can bicycle, which is what I did. I walked and I bicycled. Uh, First half of my career here, right? And it's in, uh, you know, it's a walking distance to Kingston, Kingston School, Happy Hollow School. You know, it's in a good school district. Right. So, yeah, it's been a, it's been a great little house, and uh, we've loved it, and we still do love it. In fact, we especially love it now that it's all cleaned up for the the, the <laughs> house country. sale and the new occupant, and uh, we love it so much that we're wondering why we ever sold it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I was going to, you got a couple of awards, uh, you won the Associated Press Picture of the Month, and you've had, uh, how about the Indiana Bicentennial Photo Contest? Do you remember that? I, I, something I read, and that that's kind of unique. I what, do, uh-huh. Tell us a little bit about that. I don't remember much about it. I remember just submitting. Where did the things appear? Was it something in Indianapolis, or? Uh, I can't recall. Oh. don't remember much about that. But I just remember uh, either being asked to submit something because someone had seen a picture that they thought would be a good entry. I was, again, not, not much for contests. My boss liked me to enter contests because of the reputation of the university, and I did that. And, uh, and most of the awards I got were, were at the request of sure. my entering contests because of my boss's you know, and that was that was another. Someone asked me to do it, I, and so I can't remember much, many details yeah. about it. But I'm that's sorry. nice because they're on the lookout for it, and they, and they like to share it with you, and they know this is coming across the desk, and you'd be a good person to, yeah. just like any kind of a. My recollection start. was, however, on that one, Catherine, was that uh, it was something I did at the Feast of the Hunter's Moon, and I could be totally wrong, but that's my recollection, and I did. Uh, uh, back in the early days of the Feast of the Hunter's Moon, when they were just starting it. Right. Uh, it was Bill Baugh uh, who was kind of organizing that, and they hired me to, to cover those events. I covered those for probably, I think, 10 years before I just had enough of the Feast of the Hunter's Moon, and, right. uh, and we decided... Well, the crowd, it was a lot smaller, in the, much smaller. It was, well, it's a local thing. that right? had a lot to do with it, uh, right. because when I first started doing it, uh, it was really easy to photograph. I could get very close to the, to the people who were doing the work, sure. whether it was flint napping or... And, uh, and I could show the little kids watching them, and it was very easy. Then, as years went by, it just became a colossal crowd and really hard to photograph personal situations and, and the traffic and the driving. And Susan and I just decided, you know, uh, we've had enough of that. We just decided to do other right. things. And so I stopped working for them. We, we still went to several of them, but just a time and place of our own choosing, you know, so. Right, um, yeah, it, it's, it's like, well, like Brown County years ago was a lot smaller, not yeah, as many, yeah. and things change over time, too. But that that has been a huge change, yeah. and, and they've made uh, a, a huge success of that event, and uh, yeah. and a lot of their budget depends on that event. That's right. Now your your next stage, uh, the next stage, what are you going to be doing? Now well, we have doing? sold the house. Uh, I Susan retired over a year ago. And I was determined to just 
follow right after her as quickly as I could. But nearly, I think, one month or two months after she retired, she was diagnosed with cancer. And so at that point, I pretty much left the decision up to her. And I said, what do you want me to do? I can, just, I can retire today and just, you know, be home and help you, or I can keep working. And at that point, we both felt, and she especially felt, she would be more comfortable if I stayed at work where uh, the income was assured and the insurance was assured. And I, I told her that, you know, even though I was retired, I would still have income from that, so I heard. So, but, but she just felt better if we kept as many variables standing still as possible. So I stayed at work. And a year later, we started discussing it again after she was finished with her cancer treatments. And I thought, well, when, when should I retire? When's a good date? And we could never come up with a really good thing to, to nail it, to hang it on. So, so finally, I just said, well, why don't we just put the house on the market? Let the house make a run. Because with the housing market, what it is today, that could be a year or two. So I thought, we'll put the house on the market. If it, if it somehow sells, then we'll just get motivated and get out of here. And if it doesn't sell, I'll just keep working and we'll keep babysitting the house for as long as that takes. So we put the house on the market. And of course, three days later, it sold. So, <laughs> so <laughs> then the panic sets in, you know, and uh, so what do we do next? And, uh, but the fact that it had sold was not the, the really bad news. We figured, well, maybe the new owner will, will not be interested in occupying until the fall semester or something. That wasn't the case either. She wanted it end of June, we, we tried to barter with her. We tried to say, how about end of August? And she said, I got to be out of my current rental. How about end of July? So end of July it was. And so we're closing on the place July 25th. <laughs> and my last day at Purdue is uh, this Friday, four days from now. And, uh, and I think we'll, we'll sign the closing papers at 10 o'clock on Friday and we'll get in the car and the truck and everything else, the, the armada, and we'll head for Sheboygan, Wisconsin later that day. So, Is it, Do you have something lined up? You know, we do. To, We've oh. had a house up there for several years. Oh. It's a real cute little two-story bungalow. Uh, sits right on Lake Michigan. It's three doors from the lake, um, and it's, uh, it's overlooking a big grassy bluff that's about 100 feet above the lake, which tapers down to a a beautiful city beach which goes right into the city of Sheboygan. So uh, it's that a perfect sounds. place to, to just walk down to the end of our, our street and sit on this grassy knoll and watch the fireworks down in the city of Sheboygan over the, the lake. And a uh, fun little place. Sounds very nice. And it's about uh, three blocks from our daughter's house. So, so oh. we'll be spending a lot more time with Leslie up there. Yeah. And, uh, and probably shoveling a little more snow, although <laughs> it's not a corner lot, so I won't, I won't maybe be shoveling so much snow as I am here. <laughs> oh dear. How about a favorite Purdue tradition? Does something stick in your mind? You got one favorite tradition of Purdue's that comes to mind? Uh, lots of traditions have come and gone, and the traditions we have now that, uh, that come to mind, I guess, are, are photographic traditions. That I that I do sure. every year. Grand Prix would be one, or Rube Goldberg machine contest would be another, um, and those are things that <laughs> I've been here so long, and I've been I feel like I've been so many different people while I've been here. Sure. That first of all, I start covering one of the, these events, and I'm and I'm cynical and bored, and it's like. Or, or maybe the opposite, maybe, oh, wow, this is so cool, you know. And then, you know, next year or two years or three years later, it's like I'm the opposite. If I hadn't been cynical, I am cynical now. And if I was just, oh, boy, then I'm like, oh, my God, you know. And not so, again, right? <laughs> not again. So, uh, but these are things, uh, Rube Goldberg is still fun for me. I still enjoy shooting that contest. It's still uh, just kind of fun. If, if the contest itself isn't fun, it's a, it's a good exercise for me to just uh, to see how sharp I am uh, to, to nail the reactions of the kids when they have a good run through or something. Because a lot of that is a, I don't know if you've seen the Rube Goldberg contest, but it's right. messy. And it's not a good event really to do with still photographs. It's a better video event. It's a really good video event. It's a poor still event. 
uh, because of the clutter and the mess. So a lot of what I do, do is try and frame the, the machine as, as part of you. People want to see what the machine is, even if it's just a ping pong table full of clutter. But basically, I think they're interested in the people who are running the machine. And if the kids are like biting their fingernails or if they're jumping up and down or if they're high-fiving each other, something, you know, the emotion is going to make that an interesting picture. And so that's what I try and do. So it's a sharpening exercise for me as is Grand Prix, as are all those events. They're just, and so, like I say, whether my interest is, is up or down or sideways, sure. I can always get something out of it. I always can make it at least an exercise Once you get myself. there and you take a look, and then there's something. I remember when they brought that back, you know, because it had not been right. gone for a long time, and they started in the third floor of Stewart Center. That, and they went, that's right. And then they were down <laughs> in the ballroom. That's and they right. Had to, because I, I would go to them, and then you'd have to m quickly move from one to the other in order to get close in oh, to yeah. see them. And yeah. then the Elliot is better because of the seating and the video and the screens and, and everything. And now it's in the armory. Yes. And that's so, right. yeah, yeah, that's right. The venues have just been, they've tried everything. Right. And that's another thing. It's a tough event for yes. for people. I mean, uh, it is. the kids. And because you, you can't, you have to sit a long way from the tables and the the things that are happening sometimes are small details. They're water dripping into a jar or some small thing. And you really thing. need to be right there in order to be able to see it. Exactly. You right. either need, And even if you are right there, you need to pretty much have someone pointing at, here's where we are now, here's where we are. If it's not a big hammer swinging or something that, that's visual, but that's again why it's a good video event. You can sure. have five different cameras and each camera can show you the event that you're supposed to be looking at. The cameras right. know where your eye is supposed right. to be exactly. at that point. So. Yeah. But that's one of the fun events, and yeah. so uh, you know, and and like I say, my my interest comes and goes, but uh, but to a certain degree, commencement is another one that I have just been just bored, senseless with at certain times, and just fascinated and in love with at certain other times. Right. And uh, it was especially nice for me shooting this uh, springs because I sensed that it might be one of my last, if not my last. And, and produce commencements are always, especially inside. I mean, well, the whole thing, outside, the parade outside is beautiful. The exercise inside is, I think, as beautiful as, as any commencement exercise in the country. Uh, they just really do it right. And uh, there aren't many universities who do a commencement right. exercise There's like There's always Purdue. a fountain you can run through there afterwards, you know? And whatever. that's been the source of all <laughs> kinds of shots, uh, publishable and unpublishable. <laughs> and. Uh, it's in a lot of scrapbooks. <laughs> when, uh, when they <laughs> first loves. built that fountain, in fact, and my son was uh, was an engineering student here at the time, and, and uh, he had just come back from New Zealand, I think, where he spent his junior year in study abroad. And while he was in New Zealand, he really sharpened his kayaking skills and his rock climbing skills. And so first thing he did when he came back and saw that fountain was, of course, to climb it. And so he's, I think he's climbed every pillar on that fountain. And don't, <laughs> don't tell anybody. <laughs> Nobody's supposed to know. <laughs> oh, how about an outstanding event? Do you any would you like to share with us on that? Well, uh, there was the time when I was uh, was put under arrest, I guess, by eight Purdue policemen at one time. Uh, uh, that was also at commencement. We could go into that if you want to. And it's your call. It was uh, the bell tower was just being built. It was uh, it was almost complete, but I don't think the bells had been installed. It was uh, it was a complete structure, but it wasn't functioning. It didn't have carillons or bells. Anyway, it was a great photographic tower for me, and and it was a it was a site that I had access to uh, via the construction company. And so I was up and down as they built this thing. I was keeping a record of the construction as mm -hmm. it went up. So I I knew that tower like the back of my hand, and I was you know in it a lot because of the vantage point. Again, it, it gave me a lot of good photographic angles. So when commencement came along that year, I thought perfect place to shoot the, the commencement parade was from that top of that tower. So uh, my office was in Enad at that time and I came into Enad that morning, got my cameras, went across the street. The ladder was in place. I, I went into the construction fence, climbed up the ladder, it was just a construction ladder, and then went up the stairs inside the, the bell tower, got to the top, got all my lenses out, started shooting the event, shot the whole parade as it, as it unfolded, and as it was... Is this coming out of the armory? 
They come out of the armory right. and they go up to right. MSWE. I say a, that for the research center. Exactly, and the that's right. They leave the armory. They come up the south side of the Hall of, Hall of Music and the and uh, right. Hubby Hall, and then they go up to MSWE and they come down the mall and around the fountain. And it's a beautiful shot. After they were all inside the building, and it was all over and done with, and the crowd had sort of thinned. I started gathering my gear, and as I as I got up to start down, I noticed there were quite a few police down at the bottom of the bell tower, and so I thought, okay, here it comes. So I got my gear, and I went down the stairs, and I crawled down the ladder, and I walked over to the fence, and I said, hello. <laughs> and he said, uh, we're wondering uh, what you're doing up there. And I said, I was taking pictures of commencement. You know, well, do you have permission to be up there? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I actually do. And, and for once in my life, I did. I had a letter from the construction company in my wallet, and I took that out and showed him to him. And so I said, okay, um, that's fine. So how'd you get in? Uh, we noticed there's still a padlock on the gate here. And I said, Oh, well, yeah, there was enough room in the gate that I could kind of squeeze through. And, and uh, so he said, well, just come out the same way you came in. And so I squeezed through the gate again, and I saw that I could actually do it. And I'm a, <laughs> kind of a skinny guy. And so uh, he said, well, you gave, it, gave us quite a scare uh, because we didn't know who was up there and we didn't know what you were armed with. And uh, I said, come on, you guys all know me, and uh, <laughs> which was pretty much the case. Yeah, but we didn't know who you were until we put the glasses on you, you know. So I said, okay, so what's the deal? And the deal is, you know, when you do something like this, give us a call first. So anyway. <laughs> but, uh, Interesting. All right. Oh, any closing comments that you'd like to share with the researchers or anything in summary that you'd like to say? Uh, don't know how back. much it has to do with research, but it's been... Uh, the people who will be hear hearing this. Well, yeah. it's just been an amazing time in my life. I, I, I wisecracked, uh, I think, at my retirement thing it's uh, your comments the, were very nice thank you very they much. were very nice I was appallingly emotional and I knew the only way I was going to get through that was just to read my notes if I if I spoke them I was going to get way too emotional and it wouldn't be a pretty sight so uh, I thought I, I would have a fighting chance if I just read my notes but Went one thing well. I think I'm, I, I said was thank you for the best 40 years of my life and I, I did mean that from the bottom of my heart because it's been just an honor to work with all the people here. Every every time the job would, would get to something where I didn't like and didn't think I could do anymore, the people got me through. Every day I walked into that office uh, brought a smile to my face just because they're an amazing bunch. Journalists in general are, are amazing people. They're, they're well-educated, well-informed. Any day of the week, any, any week of the year, you can walk into that office and drop any subject you want on the table and someone's going to pick it up and run with it. And, and they're going to know what they're talking about and you're not going to get any freebies. Um, so they keep you sharp, they keep you honest. And uh, it's just a very stimulating situation. And I cannot imagine not having that in my life. That's going to be really hard. Right. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, not being on this campus anymore, not seeing it every day. It's been a huge part of my life for 40 years, and, uh, and it still will be the rest of my life, but uh, I'm, I'm going to miss it intensely. It's been a huge but you'll pleasure be in touch. You'll and keep a in huge touch. honor. I will. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not out of your hair quite yet. <laughs> we're, we're planning on keeping our involved in our gourmet group down here, and we've promised to keep our mechanic and our hairdressers, and I, so we'll, we'll be back. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you, that, David. Really do. Thank you. Again, Just it was a pleasure today. and an honor. Thank you. Uh,